Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Remnant Radio. I've got Dr. Jordan Cooper on the other line, and we're going to be discussing theosis, so you guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd fun show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. If you don't know, Dr. Jordan Cooper's been on the show a couple of times before. You can go back into our archives and watch us talk about uh, Lutheran soteriology. We've done stuff on uh, Sola Scriptura uh, and uh, w- what he's most uh, unfortunately, least known for is winning the the greatest beard competition between him and Jeff Durbin. Mm, impressive. He was actually voted a better beard than Jeff Durbin. That's a big deal. Wow. So that's we're a, expecting that's a some serious good stuff from you today. Serious Dr. accomplishments. Cooper. I mean. Yeah, that's uh, it's my proudest accomplishment in life. I, I, and I, it's it's just a shame. It's a bloody shame that people don't know about a you for it. Shame. I don't know. I've wow. been watching watching too much British stuff and <laughs> talking to Nathan online. I just I don't know. It's, it's, anyway, Michael, how I, you doing? I, I'm I'm doing bloody well. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. So that's actually that's actually a, a bad word, it isn't is it? Really bad. I didn't realize. There. Sorry. So, okay. I'm doing well. Uh, okay, so we had a great show with Dr. Tripper Longman the Third yesterday, and uh, talked about Solomon on sex, all things Song of Solomon. Uh, tomorrow, I want you guys to know about we have uh, Chris Roseboro. Uh, not going to be on the show, but we will be showing some of his video clips. We're going to be responding to some of the things that he has been saying. So that is tomorrow on our. You're looking at me funny. No, you're good. Does it sound all right? Yeah. Okay, on our to be continued episode. So make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit that like button. Uh, but to Today, we have Dr. Cooper talking about theosis. So Dr. Cooper's been on the show a number of times, so just do a search in Rimner Radio. You'll, you'll be able to find uh, all of his videos, talked about a lot of really interesting stuff, uh, Lutheran scholar. Uh, Dr. Cooper, tell us a little bit about yourself and your ministry, your books, how we can get connected with you. Sure. Yeah. For those of you who aren't, yeah, you know, familiar with me and the work that I do, um, I run an organization called Justin Center, and we're um, a Lutheran theological education organization. Essentially, uh, we do a number of things. We run a publishing house. Uh, we offer theological seminars that are offered online. And I do a weekly podcast and YouTube channel as well. Uh, Along with that, I'm also the president of the American Lutheran Theological Seminary, which is the um, seminary of the AALC, um, which is the uh, American Association of Lutheran Churches. So uh, I have written a number of books. If you want to find information about what those books are, you can go uh, to justincenter.org. And there you can kind of you can pretty much find anything you know, that I've done or that our organization has done. It's not just me working for the organization, but um, probably the most important book uh, for the present discussion is this one called Christification, A Lutheran Approach to Theosis. Uh, I'm also releasing a another book on the same topic that's going to be a lot more in depth uh, that's going to be coming out this summer on, on the doctrine of union with Christ, which really touches on most of the same themes. Yeah, and that's uh, in in the different Christian veins, it seems as if, like, it feels to me like Protestants want to talk about theosis in just the category of sanctification. My Reformed brothers really, really want to talk about, uh, not that they're not evangelical, but just a subcategory of that, that a lot of my Reformed brothers want to talk about uh, what we would call theosis as union with Christ. Uh, but I'm really interested in in defining this for our audience and discussing this. We have done another episode on theosis with Dr. Michael Heiser once before, uh, because I think there, there seems to be a bit of crossover in, that, in some of his expertise. Uh, but could you tell me a little bit, just uh, as you define it in your book and uh, in some of the other works that you've worked through, how would you define theosis for people who are coming into this conversation, uh, probably from a widely evangelical vein that's not necessarily a high church tradition that's familiar with it? Yeah, well, to be honest, I mean, the Lutheran tradition itself, at least as it exists today, doesn't really have ideas of theosis as really much of a prominent theme at all. Um, And it's something that I became interested in through reading a bit of Luther and then getting interested in some of the the Lutheran scholastics in the 17th century. And uh, I began noticing that they used the language of theosis all the time. Mm. So at some point, it kind of disappeared from our discourse. So it's not just, you know, broader evangelicalism that, that doesn't have much of a place for this, even contemporary Lutheranism. Um, hasn't as much as it did in the past, uh, and that's something that I'm hoping to recover. Um, so as we define theosis, it, in some ways there, there's 
so there are so many definitions that exist, and it depends on what tradition you're a part of. Even within, you know, Eastern Orthodoxy is kind of known as the tradition that that really emphasizes theosis. There are some different emphases and different ways of explaining it as well. So, uh, if I can give it the kind of simplest explanation that I possibly can, I would simply say that theosis is the idea that we become partakers of the divine nature, and that's that's the the biblical language. That's the language of of Second Peter, and the the language of sharing in the divine nature is something that is i mean it's so prominent in christian history it's something that shows up in i mean all over the place in the church fathers but not just in the church fathers you find it both east and west uh, in, in many different ways so if we're going to kind of do a broad definition i would say to acknowledge the existence of theosis as a, a, gen, a genuine category is just to acknowledge that in some way we share in the divine nature w- hmm. which is just the the biblical language okay. Yeah, and then so that I think the follow up to that would be what does it mean to be a partaker of the divine nature, right? <laughs> so like what is it cuz you said in some way right. to share in the divine nature. So what is that way? Yeah, well that's that's kind of where uh, some of the debate is, right? What does it mean to be a, a to share in the divine nature because you know, Peter just kind of says this statement and then moves on to talk. I mean, he talks about things that are connected to it uh, living virtuously, uh, which seems to be kind of an outcome of of what this means that we share in the divine nature. Um, but it's not like there is a lengthy scriptural exposition of that and explaining mm-hmm. all the details of exactly what that means. So people have come up with kind of different ways to, to talk about it. I will say, let me just start by saying what it's not, because maybe that's more yeah. helpful. On the one hand, to be a, a to share in the divine nature is not just to say that we model our moral lives after God, right? That's that's that would be a view that says that's only basically imitation. Like the language that Peter is using is more of imitate Jesus or imitate God, um, and that wouldn't be like a realist approach to to theosis. So that kind of view it does exist uh, w- within some some Protestant circles, but but I would say that that's kind of not theosis. Um, so uh, that's on the one side I would say that, and then on the other side I would say sharing in the divine nature is not to share in the divine nature in the way that Jesus does at the incarnation. And this is something that a lot of the Lutheran Orthodox, as they talk about the doctrine of mystical union, which is kind of our way of talking about theosis. That's the, that's the more common term. It doesn't mean they never use the language of divinization because they do. But um, the, we often put kind of boundaries on this to say, like, what is it not? And, and we know that somehow it's real. It's a real sharing. We really do share somehow in, in God's nature, but not in the same way that Jesus does so that I cannot say about myself, I am God. Right. It's not a or in other words, it's not a personal union mm-hmm. that we have where there's a, a single person. So I am both distinct from God and I also share in in God, in the divine nature, in some way. Uh, and I know I keep saying in some way, and the reason why I'm doing that is because this is something that is is a mystery, and the, the reason why that language of mystical union is, is used so often is because it is a mystery, mystical meaning mystery. Like, we don't quite totally grasp um, what this looks like and, and exactly how this works. Um, but the language that's also used is things like we, uh, the divine and human natures are so intimate that they, you know, they, they interpenetrate one another. Um, you know, it's, it's this intimate personal sharing, uh, which is why, for example, uh, when Paul is speaking about sexual sin, um, in, in first Corinthians, he mentions that, you know, you can't be joined to a prostitute because you're joined to Christ. So um, the point of, of that whole analogy is to say that there is something so intimate about that union we have with Christ that it models even a, a, the sexual union in some way, um, which, which points to just a, a real intimacy that exists there in that in that sharing. Okay. Now you said you said this that uh, people different. Uh, different people are going to articulate theosis in a different way. Is it is it possible that you can kind of give us a synopsis of some of the uh, the patristics who are using the language of theosis, um, and, and maybe they're not using yeah. the precise words theosis and or and or Protestant fathers who have spoken about this issue as well. Yeah, so um, you know there there can be a lot said about the various views, and I think even among Protestants, maybe we can talk about that a little bit too. Some differences that that exist there, even at the Reformation, but uh, among the Church Fathers. I'll say that the when you start at the very beginning, right? Look at someone like Ignatius of Antioch, 
he speaks about sharing in Christ specifically in relation to suffering, which is something that Paul often does, um, w- which is to say that there's something more going on in the language there than just we share in suffering in that Jesus suffered and we suffer too. No, this is we we somehow suffer with him. And particularly Ignatius is going to emphasize this because he, like Paul, is suffering and he eventually is, you know, martyred. So that's that's the context that he's thinking of and that's what he's he's speaking about. So that tends to be the the place where um, where it's emphasized. Uh, but beyond that, also uh, Ignatius will talk about uh, Holy Communion as the um, the medicine of immortality. So that there is something of, and, and he's very clear that this is the true, he believes it to be the, the real body and blood of Christ um, that, that he's partaking in, in the Eucharist. Um, but this is the medicine of immortality. Immortality is something that belongs to God. Uh, and so in, in that intimate sharing of that communion meal and receiving Christ, uh, we are we are fed unto eternal life, or we, his eternal life is shared with us somehow. So you find that, that in, in Ignatius, and those are probably two, two main areas that he emphasizes something like theosis. Now, um, after that, you get to uh, the figures like Justin Martyr and Irenaeus, who are a lot more explicit and then leading up to Athanasius in, in his on the incarnation, uh, where Athanasius makes the famous statement um, that God became man, that man might become God, and and that ends up being a kind of summary statement of Theos. Now, of course, we have to unpack that because those who aren't used to hearing that language can be very probably a little on edge hearing that. Um, but the thing that you find, I think, in Irenaeus, in Justin, and Athanasius is the emphasis tends to be on the incarnation in something that is accomplished at the incarnation itself. So that through the incarnation, the the intimacy, the intimacy of the union of the divine and human natures in Christ does something to humanity as a whole, that we as humans now share in, in the divine nature in a way that was not possible apart from the incarnation. So in a way, it's that that intimacy that that is there in, in the eternal son taking on the human nature that is shared with us. Um, so, you know, from there, we do have the development of the idea in some different directions after that point. And what you do find in even quite a few Eastern Orthodox scholars dealing with this is um, a recognition that there are kind of, in some ways, two different streams of thought in the early church on, on theosis. And the one that you find in the figures I mentioned is really going to emphasize the divine economy. It's going to emphasize the incarnation. It's going to be very Christological, centered on the person and work of Christ. And on the other hand, you have things like uh, the, the writings of, of Pseudo Dionysius, who is is much is speaking. He's using similar language, um, but he is coming more from the perspective of, of Neoplatonic philosophy in many ways. Uh, and when I say that, I don't mean to say that all Neoplatonic philosophy is bad, but he does tend to be using those categories. And the way that he speaks of theosis tends to be more kind of experiential mm. and, and focused on the kind of uh, negation of, we could talk about apophatic theology, maybe we can unpack that a little later, but um, understanding God by way of, of negation. It's not so incarnation-centric as you find in, in some of the other early sources talking about theosis. Okay. <clears throat> So say that word again, apothetic theology. Is that did I say it right? Yeah. Okay. So he's going to correct you. Say it again. Good. Apo- apophatic. Apophatic, okay. which awesome. is like the God is not this, and we can right. never know what God actually is, but we can know what He's not. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Um, here's a question from Dustin Neely, who comes from an Eastern Orthodox uh, perspective. So he says, since the Western view of divine simplicity does not allow distinction between God's essence and energies, parentheses, activities, how do you avoid apotheosis? Yeah, so let me, there's a lot to unpack there. So let's first, uh, let me first maybe define apotheosis and what that even means. If we're talking about apotheosis, like what is that? Um, So apotheosis is the idea that you actually become God as God is God. In other words, this is what you find in, in like Mormonism, for example, um, that we are, you become the same kind of being as God. And of course, in a, in a, any Orthodox approach, and by that, I just be broadly Orthodox, not Eastern Orthodox, but uh, in any Orthodox a- approach to salvation, we're always going to have to retain that creature creator distinction i mean that's pretty key to christian theology yep. uh, that we are not god you know i mean read the book that's of isaiah really like, important 
Yeah, like you can't you can't bridge that. So you this is one of these areas in theology where you have to be so careful as to what you're saying, and you have to define things really well, uh, because you can fall into heresy if you're going kind of where the Mormons go, which is apotheos to say, I become a God, just as God is God. We're the same kind of being now. Um, you know, that clearly is not the case. I mean, in a way, that's not just in a way, it is like the root of the first sin, right? You shall be as God. Um, and, and in defining the differences there, sometimes I just point out the fact that in the creation account, um, man is made like God, which means that there is a good way in which man is like God, but then later the temptation is that man would be like God. So there's also a bad way in which man is not mm -hmm. is, is like God. So he's not supposed to do that. So we are supposed to be like God in a way that still retains that, that creature creator distinction. So um, in Eastern Orthodox theology, specifically when you get to the later Middle Ages, uh, there ends up being uh, a debate about this, a group called the Hesychast. You have a, a figure named Gregory Palamas, who's a very influential figure um, for, for the development of, of Eastern Orthodox theology in that era. Um, and there there is a concern over language of sharing in the divine essence, that if we share in the divine essence in some way, that would mean that we would become God, like really in essence, God. And so what they, they did was um, they started making this distinction between God's essence and then God's energies. So this is the the energy, uh, the the activity of God, I think, as he, as he said. Um, so sometimes the analogy that's used to describe the relationship between God and his essence and energies is like, you know, the sun and its rays. Um, and, you know, that that predates um, hesychasm. I mean, even like someone like Plotinus uses that kind of language. But it, so it's the activities are distinct from the essence itself. So the energy is distinct from the essence. So th the reason why they use this distinction is to say is to preserve that creature creator distinction. So then to say that, well, we don't actually share in the divine essence per se, we share in the divine energies instead. So that they can confess we share in the divine nature without the danger of confusing, you know, the, um, the essence of man and the essence of God. Um, so I know that's a lot to unpack there. No, I've, just, I, I, I just want to keep ahead. unpacking the sun analogy because yeah, I think yeah. I've heard, I think it was an Eastern Orthodox guy that I heard this from, um, but he said something to the effect of, um, theosis is like an iron in the fire, right? Like think of a, like a piece of rebar, something really thick and metal and stick it in the fire. And, uh, the rebar becomes red, like the fire is red. Uh, it becomes hot, like the fire is hot. And if you leave it in there long enough, it'll even actually emit light, like the fire emits light, but the metal never becomes the fire. Right, so it's partaking of the fire's nature, but never actually becomes the fire itself. So some of the question of apotheosis that I'm I'm curious of, because you know, as being in the charismatic movement, there we, we want to define ourselves as this and not that, and, and trying to be careful in yeah. in those kind of streams that we're hanging out in. You made a statement from um, uh, Irenae, no, Irenae, uh, Athanasius, Athanasius, okay. uh, that said God became man so that man yeah, could yeah. become God. Uh, that sounds like Kenneth Copeland, right? So, like, help me understand yeah. the difference. You know, when you say partaking divine natures, I mean, a lot of the the little God doctrine that comes from uh, a certain stream right. of charismaticism um, says that because we're gods, we can speak things into existence, which is, I, I would say, a part of something that's uniquely divine. But if we're sharing in that divine essence, why not? Yeah, uh, yeah, that that that's a good question. So, um, Athanasius' statement is prone to be misunderstood if taken out of context, and I think that's that's clear. Um, at least, and I can tell you within the Lutheran tradition, when you do have someone like um, uh, C.F.W. Walther, who was the first president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, uh, he preaches very theosis kind of language, especially. Um, when it's it's around Pentecost because we're seeing up the indwelling of, of the Spirit within us, and um, you know he cites Athanasius, and I've seen this uh, I've seen this a few different times in his sermons, uh, but but he's much more clear to add the word like there to say that God became man that man might become like God, <laughs> just to, to to kind of clarify because just that's in really case. What Yes, because that's really what Athanasius is saying. And you do find these like Mormon apologists and you find people in the, the kind of extreme end of that word of faith movement who are who grab on to maybe some of these statements without even having probably read the, the actual text from Athanasius. But uh, and then jumping to these conclusions. So I think if, if you read Athanasius, it's very clear that that's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is that there there is this this exchange that occurs that as God takes upon himself a human nature uh, and through this the Logos, 
and especially living in in such a, a humble way, there is this what we call the humiliation of Christ, and that God humbles Himself, and in that we then are exalted, right? So there is there is this humbling of God and the exaltation of man at the same time that occurs as a result of of the incarnation, uh, and so we can speak about sharing in the life of God. Uh, we can speak about communion with God. We can speak about being like God. Um, there, there are many ways to define what Athanasius means by by that statement. Um, but yeah, I think that the statement itself is very often prone to misunderstanding. So well, what we're not saying is what a Kenneth Copeland would say. Uh, we're, we're certainly not saying that we... Uh, we are little gods so that we can, you know, create by our words, just as God creates ex nihilo. That's just not, it's just not biblical, right? So it, it, I would say that as we look at this language of sharing the divine nature, we can ask the question, like, well, what are the scriptural examples for that? Or how does that work itself out in scripture itself? And there, I would say there's no indication of that working itself out in the way that someone like a Kenneth Copeland would, would say that it does. Uh, and it's certainly not a way that the fathers would have interpreted those kind of passages. Okay. Uh, Dr. Cooper, I'm, I'm just kind of jotting some notes as you're talking and, uh, and trying to put some categories on, uh, on just like maybe branching out to, to really precisely define what does it mean to be partakers of the divine nature. Yeah, the three yeah. words I've written down are relational, positional, and transformational. Um, okay. and, and what I want to ask you is, is do you th feel like these are fitting words? Would you add or take away? But, but relational, I heard you use a moment ago the word communion. You've talked about intimacy. Yes. Uh, positional, I've heard you talking a lot about nature. It seems like there's some sort of ontological component of yes. Christ becoming like us, us becoming like him. There's also, it sounds like a transformational component that, at least from a pers perspective of virtue, that that flows out of theosis, but also transformational. Yep. Uh, Josh's analogy with the iron, the metal, absorbing the elements, like we're absorbing uh, the, not deity of God for sure, right. but the energies. The energies of God. You we're, we're, you know, and we're trying to land precisely on what exactly it is we're absorbing. Yeah, we yeah. know it's something wonderful. But um, relational, positional, transformational, what would you add to or take away from those three? <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, that's a lot. Maybe I should actually kind of answer the... Qu I feel like I probably didn't actually get around to specifically answering the question that was asked either about the energies. <laughs> so uh, just say, like, if, um, you know, where the, the West is compared to the East, sure. um, if I could address that, and then Please. and then I can jump into, into what you said there. Um, the So first of all, I would say the, the idea of the essence energies distinction, the language does show up on occasion in Lutheran treatments of the mystical union. It shows up in Johannes Quenstedt and in uh, David Hollatz. I know those two specifically. I think Kalov might use it as well. And, and you probably have no idea who those figures are, most of you watching, but they're uh, 17th century Lutheran thinkers. Um, and they speak about the difference uh, between the, the divine presence within Christ and what they call an energetic presence. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is that energia term that is used there that is often used in Eastern theology. Now, as I, as I say that, I have to clarify and say they never work out what that means. Like, there's not a detailed description of that. It's Lutheran. Um, you just put mystery on it. Just, just, it's, it's yeah, just mystery. Yeah, and that kind of is, that is often what we do. But I would say this. It's like the Lutheran <laughs> bumper sticker. Uh, that's a Lutheran. There's a yep, mystery yeah, back there. mystery. <laughs> hey, I mean, it's... I, I like it. We like it. We, we do. really do. <laughs> we we do embrace mystery and we we like to embrace mystery. So sometimes that means that we don't have satisfactory answers for some people. But mm -hmm. um, the the way that we deal with this though is to say w whatever it is to share in the divine nature, it clearly is not that which makes us God. And I would say that the essence energy distinction strictly made is just it, first of all, it's not something that's clearly there in these uh, patristic developments of, of theosis. And they seem to be fine explaining it without that specific distinction. Um, they, they don't necessarily see the need to, to go there. That's why this is a controversy that happens much later. Um, but it's also the case that throughout the Western tradition, there it's not like theosis disappears in the West. Uh, I mean, there I would say that Martin Luther's biggest theological influences spoke very often about, about theosis, and, and they were able to do so without using this essence energies distinction. Uh, so I simply say that uh, 
the distinction isn't necessary in order to argue for theosis. Um, it's just necessary to make the qualification that in this participation, we do not become God. In other words, we just say apotheosis is not correct. Mm -hmm. So I think the essence energies distinction is one way to kind of solve that problem or to, to maybe give some more explanation on it. I'm not convinced that, that the distinction needs to be made. Um, okay. So I wanted to get that out of the way first, sure. but now let's get to, uh, yeah, the, the categories that were, that were brought up in terms of theosis. Um, and even maybe before I get to the categories too, and I'm backing up a little bit again, because that iron and fire analogy was, was used again. And that's, I think actually really key. Um, that analogy, as far as I know, it first shows up with Cyril of Alexandria and, Oh, you know, I've read so much Cyril. Yeah, I did. That must have been where I got it. You know, <laughs> yeah, just perusing through Cyril of Alexandria. That's, yeah, that's, you have it all on audiobook. I do. Don't you? I absolutely. Just I do. Listen yeah. to some Cyril. Yeah, I figured. Every, you should. I mean, Cyril's great. Um, you know, people kind of critique his personality. I guess he was kind of argumentative and grumpy, but uh, his theological writing is great. Uh, on the Unity of Christ, I think is the text where he uses that analogy. I, I'm not positive that that's where it shows up, but. Um, Cyril was arguing against uh, the Nestorians who separated the two natures of Christ. And so the language, and I think this is really important for, for theosis, to understand the Christological backdrop of theosis, that that language was first used to speak about the relationship between the two natures in Christ, to say that there is there is unity in a singular person uh, among those those two natures, and that the human nature shares in the divine. And that within the person of Christ, you could even speak about, as Cyril does, a kind of deification of Christ's own human nature through the, through the incarnation. But that has to happen in such a way that the human nature itself re retains its humanity, its mm -hmm. humanness, right? It doesn't become a divine nature. And that discussion had to happen at, at Cyril's time because the Nestorians thought that people like Cyril were, were mingling the natures or kind of denying the humanity of Christ in some way. So Cyril's trying to, to find an analogy that is going to preserve the humanity of Christ. Now, this same debate ends up happening um, at the time of the Reformation. And this is maybe, I mean, some have seen this as the key difference between um, the Lutheran and Reformed traditions at the Reformation is a chronological difference. Uh, and you see this at the Colloquy of Marburg when Zwingli and Luther get together to kind of discuss their differences and similarities. Um, they really come to a standstill on the issue of the Lord's Supper, but more, even more specifically than just the, the presence of Christ in the Supper comes this question of the relationship between the divine and human natures in Christ. Mm -hmm. And Zwingli makes this argument that, um, that he says the finite is not capable of the infinite. In other words, that which belongs to the, the infinite divine nature cannot be communicated to the human nature. If that's true, Zwingli says, then all this talk about the body of Christ being on on the on all these altars at all these churches at once doesn't make sense with the human nature, because that would require some kind of divine attribute of omnipresence. And he says, well, that's, that's impossible, because the finite is not capable of the infinite. So he just kind of throws that out. Now, in response, Luther it contends that divine attributes actually are communicated to the human nature. Uh, and he would say that that is done by by grace, not by nature. In other words, it's it's the divine working in and through the human nature so that the human nature doesn't become non-human or less human, but retains its essential humanity while those divine attributes are exercised. So mm. the reason why that whole background is so important is because theosis really has to be based on that Christological background. It is very much for Cyril. And when that language then shows up in someone like uh, Martin Chemnitz, who's a very important, uh, he's, you know, they call him the second Martin. He's the most important figure for our tradition other than Martin Luther. Um, and he has this massive on the two natures in Christ where he expounds upon a lot of this. But he's very clear in, in seeing that there is this connection between the union of, of natures in Christ and then what occurs to us as well. So that that becomes kind of paradigmatic for our sharing of the divine nature. So that iron and fire analogy is then used by Chemnitz and other early Lutherans as well, taken from Cyril, initially to talk about um, the relationship between divine and human natures in, in uh, Christ, but it applies in the same way to 
to our theosis, I would say this the same the same thing. And and I would point out, of course, as I already mentioned, you know, you you have to say, of course, the the union that I have with the divine nature is not is not the same as Jesus, right? I'm not Jesus. I, I don't. I'm not an, a hypostasis of of the divine nature. You know, I'm not. I'm not God in that sense. Okay, of course I'm not. Um, but but that sets the groundwork for something we then do share in. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so I know that was a lot of background. It didn't actually address your question. No, so now- it's okay. Uh, like if we talk about the positional, I think that's probably a good place to start. You talk in your book about justification and that theosis flows from a position of justification. So maybe positional would be a good place to start. Sure. And then we can kind of follow through some of the, that other stuff. Yeah, sure. So that that is a good place uh, to start here. Now, that's one of the areas be- where you're going to clearly see a difference in terms of the soteriology of, say, the Lutheran tradition that I'm coming from and the Eastern Orthodox tradition. And the the, the criticism that you're often going to find of, well, of any adoption of Theos's language from a Protestant perspective is going to be, well, you guys believe in forensic justification and Theosis is not this kind of positional or forensic view of salvation. It's this uh, view of salvation that is more like sanctification. It mm-hmm. is more like this kind of moral striving and, and change. It's a process. And of course, you know, as heirs of the Reformation, we argue that, well, justification is not a, a process. Justification is this perfect work. We have the the righteousness of Jesus that covers us. Coram Deo. It's imputed to us. Yeah, right. Coram Deo. Before God, we are, we are perfectly righteous. Uh, we grasp Christ. Uh, and receive all that is his. We have his righteousness as a covering, uh, faith alone. You know, all of these categories, well, they don't seem to make sense with with theosis. It seems like just the opposite. Well, um, the argument that, that I make is that there's no reason to pit these ideas against each other. And that when you find, I, I would say in the best of, of our tradition, but, but also the, in the patristic sources as well, there's no need to kind of pit these categories of anything that's like legal or forensic over against something that is transformative. And some of the dialogue in the 20th century from from both the Protestant perspective and the Eastern Orthodox perspective has kind of pitted them against each other, whereas the East says it's all participation. Protestants say, no, it's all forensic. And then we can battle it out. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, some Eastern Orthodox scholars today have kind of recognized even as well that it's not that simple. There's actually quite a bit of forensic language historically in the East as well. It's not to say it's identical with Luther's doctrine of justification, but it's not like those legal categories just weren't there. Uh, so the argument that I make is they're just both, they're simply both scriptural. Um, so so I would say that uh, in, in terms of our status before God, that is based solely on the righteousness of Christ uh, imputed to us. Right. Our justification is our standing before God. Our standing before God is secured solely by faith uh, as we grasp Christ. But I would say out of that, though, grows like a life of, of intimacy with God, right? There, that, that grows out of that and, and is part of the Christian life. Just because it's not justification does not mean it's not important, mm-hmm. right. essentially. So then um, that touches on the relational element. So. Yeah. Um, so that was another category I, I put on this, uh, and, and I want to get your feedback on that. Is there something like, hey, if I understand theosis, I can get closer to Christ than if I didn't understand theosis? Like, uh, you know, somebody who's never even heard this term, but they're praying and they're reading their Bible and they're trying to grow closer to Jesus. Is theosis happening to them and they just don't even know it? Like, talk to us through this relational component experientially. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's. I think that's a great question. So, uh, as we think about experientially what this means, um, here maybe I can start with what is a difference between someone like Luther and some of the uh, mystical traditions that that were going on at the same time, because I think this gives you an idea of maybe what some of the differences are between the way Luther would would do this and the way some others would. Um, so, in in mysticism in the late medieval period. Um, there, there generally was this this union with God was seen as kind of this end goal of a larger process. And there was this process of, uh, you know, purgation, uh, the purging of sins and illumination. There was a lot of um, asceticism tied to this. It, essentially, it was this idea that if you're going to live the mystical life, that you have to work really hard for what is this end goal of union with God. 
Well, Luther himself is very much influenced by the mystical tradition. Uh, and the authors that he cites favorably the most are, are my mystical theologians. I mean, the, the, I think there's no doubt about that. And he cites them very favorably. Uh, he cites them very favorably as, as forming a lot of his um, his own ideas. But something that, that Luther really grabs onto is this, this little book called the Theologia Germanica, uh, it, which is what he calls it. That's not actually the, the name of it. But it, it's an anonymous book by an anonymous author. We don't know who wrote it. And it's essentially a mystical treatise. It's a treatise about experiencing God, really. Um, but in that book, that particular author speaks about the the experience of of you know his intimacy with Christ, not so much in terms of like work this much, do this, do that, very kind of works oriented approach. Instead, he speaks in terms of like passivity before God, is in stop working and allow Christ to fill you. Like, it, and Luther hears that, and I think it really shifts the way that he understands this idea of union with with Christ, which is. It's not actually something that I have to earn. It's something that I have to open myself up to in something God does. And this is uh, what's sometimes been called Luther's kind of passive spirituality. That, that spirituality is largely what God is doing for us, but also in and th in through us. Um, so what that means then is it's not that there is no striving or there is no working toward anything, but that the striving flows out of our union with God rather than in order to achieve the goal of union with God. Mm -hmm. So what, what Luther does is he kind of, he transforms that whole uh, way of looking at this as it exists in the Middle Ages so that now we are, we have this, this union with Christ. We have this intimacy with God. Um, Luther would use language like he says in his uh, Galatians commentary, which is one of his most you know famous, well-known books. He uses this, this phrase that Christ is present in faith. Mm -hmm. And so faith for Luther um, you know, yes, it, it receives blessings that we may call, you know, forensic, but also faith brings us Jesus's person. Like we have Jesus himself and, and he's present in that faith. And so Luther then grabs onto some of this mystical language, um, like language of, of rapture and, and ecstasy. And he uses that, but he uses that in the context now of the gospel of, of like the free forgiveness of sins. It, instead of, just spiritual exercises that lead to maybe these kind of heights of emotional experience, he says that really comes from an understanding of the gospel and, and how free we are in Christ and what Christ has done for us. So that the experience that we live then, it is of striving for sure. I mean, scripture uses that language. There's no doubt about it. Um, but it flows out of a place of assurance. It flows out of a place of, of knowing who Christ is, that he has died for me, that he dwells within me. Um, can I, can so, I confuse theological categories so that you can correct yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, sure. so because I used the, 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 the phrase just a second ago about quorum Deo, and like yes. the other phrase is quorum mundo. Like my, I have a righteousness before God yes. that is set. It is fixed. It is right. a position that is never going to change. And I have quorum Deo, the righteous, no, quorum mundo, yeah. which is my righteousness before men. Like I'm growing in my righteousness before men. Um, so my, my question would be that, okay, I'm seated in Christ. I'm not going to ever be more seated in Christ than I am right now, right? Yes. But my question would be, as the outflowing, as I'm as I'm receiving the nature of Christ, and it is in fact transforming me, is yes. that transformation for my relationship with God, or is that relationship for my relationship with people? Like as I'm being conformed into His image, wouldn't wouldn't it logically flow that I'm able to relate to Him more if I'm being conformed to His image now? I don't know. Like you see what I'm saying? Like it, it's kind of hard for me to wrap around my, my mind around because like Adam's in the garden. He's creating the animals, he's naming them, you know, bear, bear, dog, dog, whatever. And then Eve comes from his side and it's like, hey, this thing's created in your image. So you and you and Eve are like, y'all are y'all are two persons that now get to speak to one another because y'all are created in the image. So there's this idea that Adam is in the image of God. Adam and Eve are in this image of God. So they commune with God. That's clearly what the author's trying to communicate is that like, because you are of similar image, you commune better. So is part of theosis communing with God better and part of theosis communing with humanity better and help correct me process this with you for the first time? <laughs> yeah, no, th those are like really excellent, excellent questions um, dealing with some of our uniquely Lutheran theological framework there too. Um, so I pose, I, I, I really like Lutheranism. <laughs> I could tell it's great. No, uh, this is great. So um, 
as we're speaking about, first of all, let's take the Coromundo aspect of it, and, and then I'll take the Coram Deo aspect of it, because okay. I think we can speak in both ways. So in terms of, of Coromundo, when we think about theosis, for for someone like, like Luther, right? Luther is so Christ-focused, and this this just bleeds out into the Lutheran tradition. I mean, everything is Christ-focused. Everything is based on his person and work. Um, and so Luther, for example, looks at the writing of Pseudo-Dionysius, and he's like, there's no Christ there. Like, he hates Pseudo-Dionysius. Um, but at the uh, on the other hand, you, he, he kind of just says, he he, he says, uh, he Platonizes more than he Christianizes. Mm. And you say, oh, that, that's like pretty harsh. Luther must hate Platonism. Well, at other points, then like the Theologia Germanica is like one of the most Neoplatonic documents of the Middle Ages. I mean, it's very Neoplatonic. So like, is Luther just inconsistent? I mean, maybe, because sometimes he is. But uh, <laughs> I don't think that's that's all that's going on there. Uh, and Johann Tauler is another um, who's very kind of platonic in the language that he uses, who Luther loves, I mean, absolutely loves and reprints his sermons. Um, so the difference is really that that incarnational piece that I think is missing in, in Dionysius that is so key to the specific mystical writings that Luther grabs onto. He doesn't just grab onto anything that uses that kind of language. It's specifically when it's focused on Christ. And so when we're thinking about the, the Christological picture of theosis, as, as Jesus, because Jesus does grow, I mean, it's, according to his human nature, like there is, a, he grows in his knowledge of God, as strange as that is, scripture uses that kind of language. And as he grows in that knowledge of, of God, uh, he also grows in service toward the neighbor, right? Christ's life is lived ultimately like the goal uh, at the end of this this life of growing uh in some way according to his human nature it, it ends with this act of self-sacrifice for the neighbor in in the cross and what that means is if if our theosis which is why i use the term christification specifically uh in, and that's the title of the book um but if our uh christification is modeled on that, that means, of course, it's for the service of the neighbor. So so there's a huge Coromundo element to that that's really key is, and Luther's, of course, going to be, he's going to be very critical of, you know, those monastics who just go to the monastery and, you know, they they fast and do pilgrimages and, and all of those things, but like they don't do anything for the sake of anyone else. And he sees that as very selfish. Um, but for, for Luther, if, if we are going to be, as he says, little Christs, that's a, the word that he uses, that means that as Christ served the neighbor, we are going to serve the neighbor. Um, so the love of God grows within us, and as that happens, we grow in our service toward the people around us. So that's really key to understanding, I think, a difference between where Luther would be coming from in some of this language and where some others within the mystical tradition um, would have would have used uh, maybe similar language but didn't mean it quite in the same way. Um, so then when we get to the question of, of Coram Deo, this, this is a good question because we do say ultimately, um, you know, yeah, your, your justification, if you have faith, you are justified. Like your position before God is, is secured and like that's all you need. Uh, you can't add to to your justification. Um, it's it's a done deal, and you know we could spend plenty of time talking about that. But um, it, but uh, what about union with God then? Because it kind of seems like if there is this mystical union, it seems like there's a growth in our in our intimacy with mm -hmm. God. And I would say the there absolutely is growth, but it's largely growth on our end of things. Uh, it, it's a growth in our understanding of God's love and our experience of God's love and what that means for us in our lives, right? The change is not in God, in other words, but the change is in us. That's good, yeah. And, and that doesn't cause my justification. That's already secured, but it does mean that my experience does change and grow. And um, as you read someone like uh, Johann Gerhard, who's, yeah, he's another very influential Lutheran theologian. Um, and Gerhard's uh, Sacred Meditations is his, like this masterpiece of devotional literature. It's a wonderful book. Everybody should read it. Um, you can buy our edition that we publish. Um, no, it's okay if you don't buy our edition. It's still worth reading. But uh, <laughs> so, as, but if you read that, he does talk a lot about this mystical union. That's really key to his his speak of his his talk. Um, you know, devotionally, and um, he uses language of being divinized uh, throughout throughout that writing a few different times. Um, 
but he does speak about growth in union with God. Like, it's not like there's no room for, for growth there. But again, the growth is really on, on our side. It's God changing us. Or maybe as you get to Theologia Germanica, like are opening ourselves up even passively to, to God in his work in and through us. Okay. I like it. So I, I'd like to address the subject of ontology for a moment, just that that essence of who we are. What does theosis speak into that? Do we gradually become something different more and more? Or is it is it more like that Second Corinthians chapter five, seventeen? Uh, in Christ, you're a new creation. So maybe at the moment that you're saved, you're already a partaker of the divine nature, but you just become that more and more. So to use mixing metaphors here, maybe a little bit like uh, the Romans 11 grafting in of the olive branch, like you're mm. you're one with him uh, at the moment of salvation, but maybe the more you grow and that gr branch gets bigger and more fruitful and begins to reflect Christ more and more. Is it something like that? Like... Uh, like, does your ontology change its salvation? Does it gradually change? I mean, what, what's the historical understanding mm. of our ontology with regard to from the moment we're saved all through the the process of theosis? Yeah, yeah. So I think I think that analogy is actually pretty pretty good. Um, but when you use the word ontology, we have to be really careful what we mean by that word because it yeah. is a word that's like thrown around a lot in theological discourse, and it's mm -hmm. always, not always clear what people mean by it. Um, so when we say ontological change, meaning a change in being, we have to be really careful so as not to say we go from being human to being something else. Mm -hmm. um, because being human and being a creature is a good thing, right? Being mm -hmm. being a creature is good. And this is also this is going to be very key to Luther's theology is like we always want to not be a creature. We want to take God's authority from him, uh, which is part of the, the human desire for self-justification because we don't want to be those who just receive, right? We want to be those who like earn something or do something or, you know, have a, have a part to play somehow in, in our salvation ultimately. Um, so I, I would say that when, when we think about ontology, we have to say that what we are becoming is not something other than human, but we are actually becoming the most human. We're becoming what we're supposed to be in the first place. Mm -hmm. We're not not creatures, but we are the creatures we are supposed to be. Um, and, and that language is very common in a, a lot of Eastern Orthodox sources that deal with theosis as well. They, they make that point quite a bit, uh, to, especially to kind of clarify what, what they're not saying. Um, so ultimately, if you look at, yeah, the creation of Adam and Eve, and we, we talked about this a little bit already, but um, they are in, in intimacy with God. They're in fellowship with him. They're in his presence. Uh, and, you know, after sin, they're cut off from the divine presence. Mm -hmm. and, and that's that's really the... The, that's like what sin brings about. I mean, that's the worst thing that sin brings about is that we're, we're cut off from the presence of God. Um, so what theosis ultimately is, as we're speaking about it in terms of our, our being, it's our coming into that presence of God again. We, we become, we are now temples, as um, the New Testament says. You know, we are the place where God is present. Mm -hmm. And as we think about the process of what that means, uh, the best place we can go, I, I think, is to Paul's discussion of of this when he's using the example of, of Moses at Mount Sinai. And this is, I think, the, the best biblical text and best biblical example for, for theosis, because it's, it's such a, a vivid illustration that we know from the Old Testament narrative, and it really helps to put all the pieces together. So if you think about what, what we have in this, this story is Moses is on Mount Sinai. Now, Mount Sinai, of course, is the place where God is present. We have this imagery of, you know, ascending, being we ascend into the presence of God. And then as Moses comes down, it's like the, the presence of God is with him and is now entering into his creation uh, with his people. And as Moses is in this fellowship with God, we're told, you know, he's speaking like a man speaks to his friend. And um, the divine glory is so powerful there that he is in the presence of that it physically transforms Moses, like his mm -hmm. face literally changes. And as he comes down the mountain, they can all see it, right? It, so it has, it has had a, a physical transformation. It's, it's very similar to what we see in that analogy of the fire and the iron. Mm -hmm. Very similar to that. Mm -hmm. Um, it, and it's, it's like that illustration, but in a person, you know, so Moses doesn't become God though. He is a God to Pharaoh. So, I mean, in some sense that language can be used, but, um, but Moses, you know, he's still human. He's still Moses, mm 
but the divine glory has actually changed him so that you can see the divine glory on him. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not just that story, because that's what Paul uses when he's talking to the Corinthians as mm-hmm. the kind of illustration of growth in the Christian life is to say that, well, this is what, this is our gazing on Christ. Mm-hmm. So did this when, happen to Stephen? Did like, this happen to Stephen? Well, it says um, that, that his, his face, face was like an angel. That's what it says, it right? It does say that, yes. I was just correct. curious. It does, like, it does say that. I thought you were talking um, about Stephen in the chat for a moment. I hope. I don't know. I'm not asking. Stephen in the chat. I <laughs> hope Dr. Cooper was like, wait a second. I've got to add that in the next book. And I was like, yes. <laughs> no, I, was I don't trying know. To give I don't know if I've. I, I probably oh, I have encountered that connection before, but that's, but, but not that well, I, he's remember. about to, he's about to see Christ. So right, it, it, right. I, I've actually told the story in such a way where he sees Jesus and then is like, you know, his face begins to shine. It's actually the exact opposite. They see that he's, his face is like an angel. So they say, and then right. later he sees Christ seated at the right hand. Uh, oh, well, actually standing, I suppose. Uh, and that, that unique encounter, but, um, I neither here nor there. I, I apologize. I interrupted you. Uh, but you said that Paul was using the illustration. Yeah, so Second of, Corinthians three. Yeah, um, yeah. So it, can I read that for us? Sure. And you can yeah, just, yeah. Please Dr. go ahead. Cooper just keep commenting on it. So uh, because you said this is a central uh, a central section for really understanding what theosis is about. Yeah. Uh, so um, we'll start at verse sixteen. When uh, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So, what does that tell us about theosis? Continue your thought, Dr. Yeah, well, thanks. It's probably good to just read the text, right? I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. (laughs) It probably helps. Um, If we're going to quote source material, let's go ahead and use the Bible. (laughs) I know, right? Yeah. Um, So this, yeah, this language here is... The language of veiled faces, first of all, is used because, the you know, Moses had to veil his face because people didn't want to look on the glory of God. It was like too bright. Uh, but it's saying that we now can see God's glory directly. So we have this kind of direct vision of God's glory in, in Christ. Mm-hmm. And there's language of, you know, the spirit there as well. Um, but I think what what's so key is that as we behold the glory of the Lord, it says we are being transformed. We are being renewed day by day, and we are in the process of being transformed. So this is described as something that is continuous, and it's happening right now. You know, he's not saying that this is something just that happens on the last day. I mean, it does, ultimately, as we are in the presence of God, we are ultimately transformed on the last day. But um, but that process that occurs fully on the last day has begun now, so that as we gaze on the beauty of Christ, the glory of the gospel, uh, the joy that we find in the gospel— um, the presence of God actually does transform us. I mean, that, it's it's very clear. Um, and, and the transformation is, because it's connected with this actual transformation of, of like, Moses' being in some way, I mean, that, that's part of the picture. So this is more than just, you know, again, a, just like a moral change, right? It's more, more is going on than just we become more morally conformed to the law, which, mm-hmm. okay, I mean, not that we don't, but but there's a lot more to it than that. It, it's something that is that is actually transforming us uh, internally. Almost like a, I mean, if since it's spiritual, I mean, he's using the language of the spirit, and obviously none of our faces are literally physically glowing yet. <laughs> and he'll know. go on into the next chapter in chapter four and talk about how outwardly we're wasting away, right, inwardly yeah, yeah. renewing, we're being renewed yes. day by day. And he's actually in that passage too. He's talking about our eyes are fixed not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. So he's talking about our spiritual eyes. He's talking about our inner being. And, and so, it, would you say that it's accurate to say it's some almost like a, a beautification, even glorification of our inner being, something like that? Like yeah, definitely. Like I, I would the say... glowing, the beautiful glow of Moses' face is happening on the inside. I we have yes. glowing hearts. Something like yeah, that. I would say that, and, and I think that I your like connection it. with um, with the idea of glorification is is also one that's apt here too. Yeah, um, it's because this is glorification. It, it's yeah. glorification partially <laughs> and yes. inwardly, like awaiting it's, that real. It's just that already not yet, like touches everything, doesn't it? Like we tend to think of glorification in the Romans eight uh, sense, you know, our you know those who've been well, foreknown, called, justified. Uh, I guess I skipped yep. one, predestined, called, justified, glorified. Uh, 
glorified, of course, speaks of our final glorification, but here he's talking about a gl- gradual glorification. Yes. That's cool. Give me some theosis. So <laughs> I, I, I've got a question on gradual glorification as we're talking about this, um, sure. because I have, two, I have two thoughts. One, as it pertains to Adam, and one, that it pertains when we actually see him, right? Like we see him or we like him, those kinds of things. Um, my thought is that Adam still had divine, like, again, I'm, I'm taking this illustration. He's, he's eating of the tree of life. And this is sustaining him. It's actually, you, you use in your book the, the idea of grace, that theosis isn't like if God at any point in time chose to remove his grace, it's not like we could keep becoming like God. This is actually right. a sustaining force of God's grace. So is it, it, would it be the case that even, even perfect humanity, uh, as it is seen in Adam pre-fall, that perfect humanity still was in the process of being glorified, like like experiencing and being invited into that the triune Godhead and the nature that He's sharing, and that that we are one as as God is one. Like we're we're being invited into that divine fellowship. And then I think of the eternal state when we're with God and He is with us. Um, is that an internal process? If, if God is infinite and we are still finite, even in our glorification, are we still experiencing and and experiencing new? facets of God's glory in such a way that theosis isn't a future event that is fully accomplished at the eschaton, but like it is still accomplishing throughout eternity. Like that's a crazy (laughs) complex question. I'm sorry. I'm just like, my mind's just firing all cylinders. Really quick. Why not? Let's let's give him more questions. The verse I'm thinking of while you're talking is Ephesians two, where it says God raised us up with Christ, seated us with him in the heavenly uh, realms so that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches yeah, of his Yeah, that grace one. That's a good one. Expressed in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Mm-hmm. So in the least there will be an ongoing revelation of God's grace manifest in his kindness. That, yeah. Um, that, that there's just like... Yeah, I, I imagine it's like we'll see him face to face. It'll be like this incredible revelation, but it'll be a, an ongoing... In, intensifying revelation for all eternity. Now, that's a little dif- different from the glorification and, and that aspect, but I don't know. I'm just like, that just popped in my head. Dr. Cooper, shoot it down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two, two complicated questions, because when you ask about the, you know, the Adamic time or yeah. the eschaton, there's so much that's not revealed. <laughs> that's true, <laughs> which, right. Which makes these questions really difficult to answer. Um, so, you know, take my answers for whatever they're worth. Uh, uh, but uh, it, it certainly does seem that Adam was not in the final position that he would be in. I mean, I mean, pretty much everybody is agreed to some degree. I know Irenaeus used the language of Adam and Eve as like kids. Yeah. Um, you know, that like they, they're supposed to grow. And, and it does seem to be the implication of the text because, you know, they are eating of the tree of life, which, you know, people have often referred to as like kind of the first sacrament, right? God is using this physical thing to, to aid their life spiritually and to aid in their growth. So um, what would the end of that have been? Would it have just been like progress forever for Adam and Eve? Or mm-hmm. would they have been confirmed in righteousness at some point um, after a certain state? I mean, those kinds of questions, I just, Mystery. I'm not... Yeah, I, I'm not sure that Scripture gives a clear answer to it. Um, so, but I would say there is some. There, it certainly is expected. There's some kind of growth in at for Adam and Eve. Like, there's they're not where they should be or where they will be. Um, I think that much is at least clear. In terms of the question of eternity, I just assume that our experiences of God's glory and knowledge and all of those things, because of the infinity of God, will be a period of growth forever. Yeah. I mean, I. It, That's it, exciting it, to think about. It's cool, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, man, uh, one of the things that I, I've realized recently as I'm trying to delve into more of the Lutheran theology space is that there is, and again, please correct me because I feel like a novice in a lot of this, but the ministerial versus magisterial use of reason. And what I love about the Lutheran system of theology is that they're not using the logical syllogism sometimes of our, of our reformed brothers who will say, hey, if A is true and B is true, then it logically follows that C and D is true as well. But yeah. like Lutheranism says, A is true for sure. B is true for sure. C and D, I'm afraid to tread on those because the Bible doesn't explicitly speak. So yeah. we're going to say mystery. And I just really like 
the uh, the tension of that. Uh, I think that it actually the wonder of it, like I think by trying to like logically like uh, build out all of these presets, we actually kind of stripped like the modesty from the mystery that God has built into it. And there's something about this modesty of this mystery that I think is beautiful. Um, and I think it's helpful and, and so that we can go, hey, uh, we can speculate. And I think there's part of that speculation. Like it's like reading a good novel, like uh, like a fiction novel that you're reading. It's like they don't want you to know what's happening next. They yeah. they want to leave this aspect of mystery so that it creates excitement and it creates wonder in the heart of the reader. Um, so way to go being Lutheran. I like it. I don't know uh, what to thanks. say. <laughs> you, you, should, you should try it. I recommend it. <laughs> he's, he's literally inches away. If you, you don't can even get him know. on baptism. If you can get me on baptism. I haven't read the book yet, so I, I'm getting there. Anyway, oh, man. have you listened to my many hours of talks? I feel like I've done more on baptism oh. than any other time. Well, I listen. I listen to the Thinking Fellows uh, every once in a while. Uh, I'm not sure which Lutheran they are, uh, but uh, I know there's different yeah. synods and stuff like that of Lutherans. Yeah, yeah. So I listen, I listen to them a bit. I've listened to quite a bit of your your YouTube videos, not so much as your podcast, but and I'm going through your your written materials right now. Uh, but I also have the Book of Concord that I'm working my way through uh, amongst doing a theology show on tons of different theologies and studying lots of other things as well. So you got to give me grace and my <laughs> Lutheran conversion. Um, <laughs> it's going to take some time. Uh, anyway, uh, we're coming to that like kind of final part of our show where we kind of uh, ha- toss it over to those closing thoughts, those things that you want people walking away thinking about, maybe resources that you want them to to go and read. We have tons of unanswered questions that I you know have put together on the subject of theosis that we might yeah. have you on in the future to maybe tackle. Uh, but I'll toss it over to Michael and kind of get a golden nugget from you, your thoughts of like, hey, what should people be walking away thinking about? And then uh, Dr. Cooper will ask you the uh, same kind of question. Yeah, you know, uh, the part that's just kind of like burning in my soul right now is that Second Corinthians chapter 3, where it's, uh, we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord or being transformed into His image from glory to glory. It's just um, just remembering that the Christian life is uh, is not just about like, you know, it's not just about learning more theology. It's not just about doing your church thing and uh, and your fellowship thing like that. That that phrase that you that you you, you Lutherans use the <laughs> mystical union. I really yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. I mean, union speaks to the intimacy uh, and, and the way Dr. Cooper, you were talking about it and, and referencing the Apostle Paul, First Corinthians six, and making the connection between sexual intimacy and intimacy with mm-hmm. God. That that there is a connection. That that it's actually a pointer to the eschaton mm-hmm. and uh, and the and the beauty of that and then but then uh, mystical a mystical union and bringing these together that we as believers because we've been made one with Christ have such an opportunity to grow in deeper and deeper union to Christ and so i would just exhort you to to go after that behold the glory of the lord uh, that Ephesians 1 prayer, that God would open the eyes of our heart, that we, we may know the hope to which he has called us, the riches of his glorious inheritance, the incomparably great power of, uh, of, of well, I forgot, uh, whatever. I was quoting a lot of verses at once. <laughs> you can Google the rest of that one. We were just, that was the... No, I was trying to go too fast. Anyway, but opening the eyes of our hearts. And, and yeah. so uh, just really go for intimacy with Christ. Uh, that, that would be mine. Dr. Cooper. Yeah, um, I'm just, I don't know if I have a profound final thought. I uh, there, There's so much that I wanted to talk about here that we didn't get to because there's so much in, in this topic that we could just spend so much time unpacking. Um, I think, you know, maybe a good a good place to kind of end on is um, this this idea that you find in, in Luther of a kind of passive spirituality, which I found is something that is at least has been very influential in my own in my own kind of just private spiritual life is uh, I think in in some kind of church traditions and things that I experienced in the Christian world in the past, um, any idea of kind of intimacy with God or growth in the Christian life was either just about kind of doing more things like it was just like add on this, this, this and this um, or just about a kind of very emotional experience that you may have. Um, but I think something that, that I've really come to understand through reading Luther and reading especially a lot of those theologians who really influenced Luther was the fact that, and, and thinking through Paul and his analogy with, with Moses here, is like 
notice what transforms Moses. Like Moses isn't doing anything. He's just sitting in the presence of God yeah. and communing with God. And like, that's what God's word does to us. And if we want to grow, it's, it, it's not that there isn't striving and there isn't work. Um, but, but growing in terms of our intimacy with God is largely about coming before him passively, like coming before him with nothing in our hands to offer him and, and just receiving his grace and sitting by his word and, um, you know, receiving the sacraments. Um, and, um, you know, I'd also say something like, you know, historic practices in the church, like, um, things like the daily office, you know, just going through Psalms at different points in the day or, um, putting yourself before the word of God, where it is God himself who is doing that work. Mm -hmm. And, and so I think that, you know, the danger in this idea is we can jump to that kind of very works righteous, like attitude of like, well, I want to be, I want to be deified. So I want to be God and I want to just do all the things and get there. Like, give me the you know, 10 step plan to get there. <laughs> and that's not how this works. Like that's not, that's not real intimacy with Christ. Yeah, no, I think that's good. And I think, uh, just to your point, uh, what does it take to be God? There was a, the, a week, um, it was maybe a month ago, might've been longer, uh, real emotional day for me for whatever reason. And I came home and I was just like kind of red in the face, looked like I'd been crying. And, uh, my son's like, dad, what's wrong? And I was just like, well, your dad wants to be God sometimes, and he's not. He's a <laughs> sinner, and uh, and I want to control the universe, and I can't. And like my seven year old looks at me, and he's like, "Yeah, I get that. Like, <laughs> I'm also not in control of anything, and that upsets me as well." Uh, yeah. So it's yeah, I, I think that's a beautiful reality that God shares with us His divine nature, uh, but that we are constantly humbled by that in realizing, man, what a what is man that you're mindful of? Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and how much of it we don't share? <laughs> and how much of it? How much of it we don't share? That's mm -hmm. the opposite of theosis, which we'll have to talk about the next time you come on. Because I, I want to talk about this again. It's stuff like this that gets me kind of excited when we start talking about like the Trinity and like uh, the divine nature of who we, God we is. We should have Dr. Like, Cooper on to talk about baptism to oh, see sure. if he can sway you. Oh, on air? Oh, that's dangerous. I don't know. Ooh, that sounds fun. I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. <laughs> He's he all there, so I'm holding you to it now. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Excellent, guys. Uh, well, thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Remnant Radio. Hey, if you've been blessed by the ministry, you can uh, help support us a couple different ways. There's PayPal links in the description of the video, or you can give there on Patreon. Patreon's got some really cool stuff. Uh, where's my book club graphic? Oh, it's all moved around. Uh, but we are doing The Kingdom of the Cults by uh, Walter Martin. Uh, every Saturday. Uh, this week, we're going through the, the chapter on Jehovah's Witnesses. We're going to read. Uh, it's a massive, massive chapter, so we're going to just read a good portion of it all the way up to uh, uh, the New World Translation. We'll kind of hang out there, uh, and we'll discuss it. And there's like 30 or 40 of us that get down on Patreon, and we discuss the book. Had a really great time. At the end of it, we even prayed for each other. Uh, it was it was good. So I'd encourage you guys, if you're interested, there's cool stuff over at Patreon. As low as five bucks a month, you can support us over there, get lots of content uh, from us, uh, such as a Beginner's Guide to... Not Beginner's guide, uh, a basics course on theology that me and Michael are working on that hasn't been released yet, uh, our thoughts on popular worship songs, uh, how to discern discernment ministries, all kinds of cool stuff up there on Patreon. The, the, cat the, the catalog is growing quite rapidly. Yep. Uh, anyway, I enjoy cool. it. If you guys have been blessed, think about giving. Uh, and as always, uh, check out our shows that are coming out every single week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, tomorrow, we are doing a response video to Chris. You can go uh, check that out. Make sure to set a notification on that. You can come and watch that episode tomorrow. Uh, and then we've got upcoming episodes next week that are also in the queue uh, that you can look forward to. Anyway, blessings, guys, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>